We're good to go. Welcome, Amanda. Uh, great to be here. Welcome, LCA. Got a great interview today. Um, so Amanda Todd, one of my favorite people in real estate, uh, I think you have got such an interesting story and I can't wait for everybody to get to hear this today. And I'm sure you've told this story a million times. Uh, so thank you for joining me and thank you for joining us with LCA. Personally, um, a real estate, I'm a real estate coach as well as a uh, broker owner of a large brokerage. I work with a lot of agents and I think your story is just going to resonate with a lot of people. So with that, Amanda, um, could you give us a little bit of background on you and where you're from? Absolutely. It's good to see you, Mike. I always love getting to chat with you. Um, I'm Amanda Todd. I live in the Sacramento area in California. I also have teams in other states and locations as well. Um, I'm focusing on building up my team in Las Vegas right now, and I have a team in St. George, Utah, and I'm licensed in Nevada and Utah and California as well. A um, little bit about me. I've been in real estate for five and a half years now, and it was actually like this really funny thing the other day because I've always felt like I needed to compensate for my short period of time in real estate. And the other day, somebody asked me how long I've been in real estate. And I said, I said about five and a half years. And they said, oh, you've been in it for a while. And I was like, oh, I can be considered being in real estate for a while now. Um, I have been a single mom for many years. I had not sold a single house before my kids, dad and I split up five and a half years ago. So it was a very scary venture to start on, but my kids had never been in daycare before in their lives. I had been a stay at home mom their entire lives. And so I didn't want to turn their lives upside down even more if I could prevent it since they'd never been in daycare. I didn't want just a normal eight to five job. They were used to me being the one to pick them up and drop them off from school, being on school field trips, helping in their classrooms. And so it was really important for me to be able to support them and myself while still trying to keep life as normal as I possibly could. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. So, you know, this is one of the reasons I really love your story and why I think it's going to resonate with people. Again, as a real estate coach and as a broker donor that helps support agents, I so often see not just women, but parents in general, really try to struggle to build their business and their career while being, as you call it, a connected parent. So, you know, you've done an amazing job at this. So this is where I really wanted to highlight you today and, and try to find out, A, why'd you get in real estate? B, how did you make that work as a single mom going through all this stress at the time? And as you know, going into real estate from day one, one of your biggest challenges you need to solve is trying to get consistent income. You don't have paychecks coming in every week, right? So here's Amanda, single mom, getting into real estate, no guarantee of a paycheck. You know, walk us through that a little bit. Right. I mean, it, it truly was the scariest thing in the world because after just a few months in real estate, I actually signed away all my rights to child support, spouse support, everything, because I just said, I'm betting on myself. And so it was, it was terrifying because I wanted to keep my house that my kids and I lived in. I, in my previous life, I was a military wife. So my kids have lived all over the country and I wanted again, just to keep some stability for them. It was the house that they'd lived in their very longest. And so I had a mortgage, I had three kids. And so it was terrifying. So I literally just said, I'm betting on myself. And I would say that sense of urgency is honestly the best thing in the world. I mean, you have to have, I feel like people overuse the term, your why, your why. Well, you can have your why all you want, but having this fantastic why doesn't necessarily pay the bills. For me, if I didn't produce, my kids didn't eat. So in a way, you really bridge a gap between information of what to do in real estate and the action that it takes to, to create that result, right? So you were, you were doing actionable items every single day in spite of being a single mom. But you know, I think the conflict we hear so often with, with agents that are running around as parents and being an agent is trying to manage their clients, trying to manage their, their children and all that schedule. Like it's always a scheduling problem. Uh, so how did you, you know, how did you deal with that? Especially early on as you were still learning. Right. I mean, it was super hard because I wanted to be at everything. I wanted my kids to still feel supported. Mom was there. I also wanted them to be able to eat. Right. <laughs> and so there were times that I prioritized where I said, you know what, I'm actually not going to go on this field trip today because, and, and especially in the beginning, I actually was still able, I don't think there was a single field trip I missed, but you know, little things like my kids learned, I didn't bring them their lunch at school. 
I didn't bring their backpack if they forgot it. And again, that's for me just a principle in teaching my kids life skills. Even if I probably had had time during my day that day, I am a huge believer in teaching kids to be independent and teaching kids responsibility. And so I feel like as a whole, we're actually over-parenting our kids as a society because if we're there to pick up every single spot of slack for them, they're actually never going to learn. And so I bridged the gap by when there was something that was a priority, you know, a sports game or, you know, something like that, I would tell my clients, I have a meeting at that time. If somebody wanted to meet with me during that time, in my opinion, that sounds a lot more professional than, oh, I can't because my kids are going to be home or, oh, I can't because I have to be at this. I tell my kids I have an appointment at that time or I have a meeting at that time. They don't need to know the appointments with my kid. They just, you know, that just sounds that much more professional. Another thing too, that this may sound really small and people might kind of laugh at this, but every single day I got up, I did my hair, I did my makeup, I was dressed and ready as a business professional when I walked out the door to take my kids to school. Even if I had no appointments on my calendar that day, I was in the right mindset and truly persona to be a business professional. So let, let me back up on one thing you said, because I think this is super interesting. You just mentioned that, you know, in people, as you said, over parenting or picking up too much slack, let's talk about the result of your approach. Because I know I've talked to you in the past and, you know, it may sound harsh to people saying, what do you mean over parenting? But let's talk about the result you've had in your family with that, that approach, because I think it's pretty good. Well, exactly. I mean, it teaches kids to have ownership in their life. So for example, my son um, turns 13 tomorrow. He boxes. He's a boxer. If he doesn't have his boxing bag in the trunk when I'm dropping him off at school, he's not going to boxing that day. And he knows that. So he plans ahead. He's got his bag packed. He's ready to go. Same with you know my youngest daughter in gymnastics. I'm not going to go home and get her gymnastics bag for her because she forgot it. I'm like, look, if this is something you want to do, I am happy to support you in it. You have to show me, though, how badly you want it. And so it's really just taught my kids to learn to prepare, to plan. They pack their own lunches. They make their own breakfast. Obviously, I do the grocery shopping and make sure that things are there for them to be successful. But I mean, even down to the fact I have my kids help me plan out our menu for dinners each night, or I mean, each, each week, because then they're bought into the process. And so, so I think that's so important to teach kids this is your life. You've got to take ownership for it. Here's my life. My job is to provide for our family. So yeah, it's been really helpful. So I've, I've got a, you know, kind of a long standing philosophy that when you're really looking on how to improve your business life, you have to also really improve your personal life. They kind of go hand in hand, right? Like you got to grow, not just business wise, but professional wise. And what I'm hearing from you is you're almost working on a personal basis of delegation of roles and, you know, kind of offshoring or, or outsourcing some of the task and responsibility, you know, which then, of course, as you're building a team, I'm imagining you didn't come into real estate as a team leader. You probably started, what, as a solo agent or on a team, through a team, but you've learned through delegation and outsourcing really how to scale and are using that same approach in your family. Oh, completely. And, and again, because it's just like, because I started out as a solo agent, didn't even have the concept of ever building a team. And I have learned the same way, like you said, building a team and teaching my kids that I want my kids to not be solely dependent on me for the rest of forever. Just like I want the agents on my team to not be solely dependent on me. So I'm going to give you the tools. I'm going to teach you how to do this for yourself and you need to go and do it for yourself. You have to show that you really want it. And so kind of going back to what we, you were talking about in the beginning about agents who are having a really hard time having a good business and feeling like they're a connected parent. I think we've talked in the past about, you know, missing meetings and things like that. You also have to show your kids priorities in life too. And so if you are showing I want to be the best parent in the world. Well, I think you need to take a step back and figure out what does the best parent in the world actually look like? Is part of the job description as the best parent in the world to provide a good lifestyle for your family? 
well, then you kind of need to prioritize that as one of your top priorities. I I totally agree with that. And I think um, one thing from our past conversations that I've, I've picked up on with you is, you know, obviously the more successful you get, the busier you get, the more your schedule has to run like a real schedule, right? So I'm assuming the things that are non-negotiable for you with your family time, you're going to block those things in your schedule and you're going to do those things, right? But you're not going to feel guilty if you miss every gymnastics meet or, you know, every baseball game or every uh, boxing event, as you put it, right? So at some point, you're kind of, you know, prioritizing what you need to be at, what you want to be at, and then where your business needs to go is going to go in that schedule as well. So it sounds like a really proactive approach to me that you're taking. Oh, it is. So... For example, um, my oldest daughter plays water polo and last week she's on it. She's a freshman. She's on the JV water polo team. And so the coach had set out what the game schedule was. And so I literally scheduled my entire evening of appointments around her water polo game. Well, and and I just let my clients know. And here's another thing too, that I learned in just a really small little tip in managing your clients around your family life is instead of saying to my clients, what time works for you. So then I'm having to backpedal and go, no, I've got a baseball game at that time, you know, whatever. I say to my clients, can you see this property at 6 p.m. on Wednesday? Because I already know that I've got a kid with a game at four and a kid that needs to be picked up at three. And so I'm just, like you said, being proactive and saying, here's what works for me. And if they say, well, I need to be at this other time, I'll say, well, I'm sorry, I have an appointment that time. Or, you know, I'll try to, you know, move something around, but being proactive in managing all of it. And just honestly, it's a projection too. the amount of respect that you carry for yourself, for your schedule, that's going to project to everyone, not only to your clients, but to your kids as well. So I, you I love that. You, they're going to. I, lo- I love that thought process because I think so many agents are so insecure um, because they come from that, that mindset of scarcity that if they tell a client no or they try to redirect the client, that the client will lose value or not see the value in that person as an agent. And then they're going to go and bend to the will of the client. And then the client now controls your schedule. So for, for you, you know, on that approach, would you say that that curbs the scheduling conflicts? 60% of the time, 70% of the time, 90% of the time. How often do you really deal with a real conflict now that you're controlling your schedule? I really don't deal with them a lot. And, and mm-hmm. this may sound really bad too. <laughs> um, there are times where I'll even tell a client, like if they're really pushing for a time that there is something that's just a non-negotiable for my family that I'm just not going to miss. I'll tell the client, I'm sorry, the property is not available to be seen at that time. Right, right. You know what? It's not available to be seen because I'm not there to open the door. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so to me, that's not really a lie per se because it's not available because I can't be there. So that's one of the things that I've done too. And so again, if you frame it around a professional because people compare us all the times to surgeons and, and lawyers and stuff like that, but let's be real. Any highly sought after business professional, mm-hmm. you don't get to just call and say, this is when I want to meet with you. It, that's just not the way it works. And so I feel like our mentality and our attitude and our mindset is actually diminishing the professionalism of our, of our industry by not holding to that same standard. And don't get me wrong. I want to do everything I can to facilitate for my client's schedule when I can. And if I suggest a time that doesn't work and they suggest an alternative and I can make that work great and I will, it's just making sure that you carry yourself. And it's hard, especially for brand new agents to project that level of professionalism and that level of just carrying themselves so that people will connect with them on that level. But it really is true. It really is kind of the fake it till you make it. I mean, I remember when people would say, well, how long have you been in real estate? And I'm kind of like, oh, six months. Yeah, I mean, like, like, how do you say that? But I would, and I would say, well, I've been involved in the real estate industry for many years. I've been licensed for this many months because I bought and sold my own houses. I, you know, that kind of a thing. So, you know, making sure that you carry that level of self-confidence, of self-respect, and that is even proactive as well in a good morning routine and setting yourself up for being healthy physically, healthy mentally, 
all of that makes a huge difference. I think one of the one of the things that I really get stuck on in your story and think how do people cross the divide that you did is so many of us get in the industry and we don't have a paycheck a paycheck coming. We work really hard to get that first, second, third, fourth paycheck. And even some of us have been in the industry a while, they still struggle to create that really consistent pipeline and consistent income. And here's Amanda saying, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to get rid of my paycheck. I'm going to jump in like as a brand new agent. I'm going to control my schedule. I'm going to, you know, still be a, a, a really good family person, still be a good mom, but I'm going to control my schedule and risk it all and bet on me. I mean, that is a very tough thing in a mindset. If you're just thinking mindset, that's a tough one to get over for people, I think. Because you're betting on yourself and yet you're still controlling your schedule and you're telling clients, this is when I'm going to be available. You're kind of using, uh, I, I used to do this myself, when you're telling clients that a property is not available, I used to call my boat appointments. So when someone said, can you show me a house? I'm like, well, I'm on appointments right now. I can probably call in a couple hours. Not exactly a lie, right? But no, uh, okay. yeah. No, that's okay. Right, right. But I just love the fact in, in your mindset, because I think this is the perfect, you know, um, time to talk about mindset in your mindset what really gave you that confidence is there anything in particular that gave you that confidence to start as a brand new agent having to feed kids not you know getting rid of a paycheck and now saying I'm going to control my schedule grow a business focus on building a pipeline that's a lot that's what I mean what is your mindset like to do that it is well and, it, and one more thing I want to add to it too and then this is what I tell my agents one more step especially as a brand new agent is I call it commission breath. You don't want to have commission breath. You don't want people to feel like you're viewing them simply as a paycheck. That's worse than garlic, that breath. It is. It is. It is. Commission breath is yeah. terrible because it's selling. And I tell people all the time, I am not going to sell you want a house. I'm going to help you find a house that's the best for your family. And if I see problems with the house, if I see problems with the transaction, if I see that it's a difficult agent or a difficult seller or, you know, buyer, something like that, I, I'm going to call that out. And the biggest thing that does is it instills trust mm -hmm. for the client to you. You know, like there's times where I've been working with sellers and we get this offer that seems really amazing and great. And I'll talk them through all the reasons why I think it's a bad idea. And they appreciate that because they know that I'm not just pushing a sale on them. I'll walk into a house that's a flip and it looks all shiny and great. But then I'll look at the other day. Here's an example. An AC secondary was just spewing water out on this gorgeous flip that was $600,000. And I'm like, pause. Do you guys see this? This means the AC is not functioning correctly. This concerns me that this flipper cut corners. It may look shiny and great on what we can see, but I'm concerned they cut corners on what we couldn't see. That was the first time I'd ever met that client. And you know what? They were like, you are our agent 100% because you did not talk us into this house. And so going back to getting that mindset, it's having the mindset of abundance mm -hmm. and knowing that the way that I was able to empower myself to that mindset in the very beginning as a brand new agent is I knew that I would work harder for those clients than any other agent would because I had that urgency and that pressure on me. And I don't think it has to be, we keep going back to brand new agents. I'm sure there's people right now that are two, three, 10 years in that right. still haven't just figured out really to do what you're talking about doing right now to really, you know, uh, A, have the abundance mindset, um, control your schedule, control your pipeline building, control the activities to do so, uh, you know, really be a good mom and present when you're with, with the family. I mean, that's a lot that people struggle with even 10, 15 years into their career. Um, so I don't want to just limit it to, to brand new agents, but I think it is going to resonate with everybody. Um, so on that piece too, we go back to the why, like what got you in it? Why did you, you know, uh, feel like you want to do this? You've told me before, like if I didn't produce, I didn't eat. So your why was really that, right? You had to provide for your, for your kids. Here's the conundrum I see that happens a lot in the industry. I think a lot of people have their family as their why, if you want to call it that. But then all of a sudden their, their why becomes their excuse. They right. stop working and producing because of their, their kids' needs. Everything is gonna get pushed to the sideline 
because they're, they're a mom or they're a dad and they feel like they've got to be there for every event or they just can't seem to figure out how to, how to do both. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about how you've dealt with that? Have you had those moments where you're like, I feel disengaged from my kids or I should engage more or do something else? I mean, have you had those struggles yourself and how have you overcome that? I have. And this is the thing that I want people to understand. So work-life balance, that actually is a misnomer. You have to be present wherever you're at at the mm -hmm. time. And so if it means that you be present in your work, you can't be present in your work and feeling like you're missing something as a mom. And you can't be present as being a mom and feel like you're missing something in work. So right. I always operate on the law of compressed time. And I'm a huge fan of Darren Hardy. He wrote the compound effect and he taught, and he has like the Darren daily every day. That's like a little, like five minute snippet thing. And he talks about the law of compressed time that if you look at the most successful people, they get things done so much faster than anybody else, because it's an old bold law that basically like your task is going to take the amount of time you give it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my work day on the times I have my kids is eight to three. And when I started my career, I had my kids about 85, 90% of the time. So my work day was 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Like that was it. That was all I had. And so I had that finite amount of time to get everything done that I needed to get done. And right. so we got to imagine though, while doing that, um, you know, once you figured out how to really create that consistent income, you kind of lead into a new problem in the industry is really efficiency. Uh, right. So in that eight to three you're talking about, I'm guessing just an assumption that you had to focus on figuring out how to maximize every minute of that day because oh, yeah. You know, you're, you've grown your business year after year after year. So it's not stagnant. You're growing, which means you got to keep on doing more with the same amount of time and figuring out better ways to, to leverage your time and leverage people and resources. So, you know, tell us a little bit about how that worked. Well, and that's the thing, too, is that I also learned prioritizing and figuring out what tasks can I do when my kids are in bed? Mm -hmm. What tasks can I do while my kids are doing homework? What tasks can I do? And so it really was figuring out what, what does it take to run a successful real estate business? Like pausing for just a second and really dissecting it. What tasks actually need to be done? And then figuring out when I needed to do that task. Well, I can't really show a property at midnight, but I could probably write a repair request at midnight. I can't really, you know, be doing lead follow-up you know, at five o'clock in the morning, that probably wouldn't thrill many people to have me texting them then, right. but I can do that, you know, so, so really, and just prioritizing everything, same for my kids, you know, if there was a costume that needed to be made or cupcakes for a class or, you know, something like that, okay, when could I do that that will interfere with the you know, the least possible with the other items. And so having that law of compressed time, I learned, like you said, to be super efficient and what was I willing to give up to be that efficient? I couldn't tell you what TV shows are on TV. I couldn't tell you what movies are in the theater. I'm never on social media anymore. Like business wise, I pay somebody to do my business social media stuff. But again, I, those became bottom of the totem pole priorities because it was eat and provide for my family and be a mom. So I, I really just had to decide what was I willing to give up? to be successful. And, and uh, that's, that's an excellent point too. And another thing I want to point out, you know, when we're talking about the level of, uh, of controlling your schedule, because efficiency is all about proactive, right? You have to proactively plan these things out, which means you will have a conflict at, at sometimes when a buyer wants to see a house. We've talked about that. But I also want to add this little layer on it that we haven't talked about. You work in a lot of luxury property, right? So you, you do luxury transactions which you'd assume the luxury client is probably by assumption, the ones that are more picky on service and right. So those are the harder ones to impress. And yet here's you, Amanda saying, when would you like to see this house tomorrow at three or tomorrow at four? And they're like, well, I want to go see it in an hour. But so you've probably had to deal with that and you've gotten really good at, at directing that traffic. Right. Exactly. So like I said, that's where the good little, um, I'm sorry, the house is not available at that time or right. Seller requires more notice than that, or, you know, that kind of a thing where, again, it just comes back to that mindset and carrying yourself with that presence and that level, really commanding respect. That's really what it comes down to. And it starts again with fake it, she make it. 
don't show up in jeans and flip-flops, you're not going to command a lot of respect. Right. Don't show up in, in your running clothes. I mean, and obviously those are, you know, a friend or whatever, but even my friends, even when I've done deals with my friends, I still show up in my business clothes. And in fact, it's actually more important in many ways to command that professional respect because they'll actually respect you a lot more. If you've got friends that you're, you know, they're going to want you to give them a deal. They're going to respect your opinion less. There's, you know, so it's just so, 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 so important that there's the old um, saying of get up, dress up and show up. Mm -hmm. That actually is real. And it really makes a difference. And I can't even tell you how many transactions I've gotten from just my normal daily routine of school pickup, of grocery shopping, of whatever, in business clothes. And, you know, you just get to know the people in your network that you're around constantly. And people say, you're so dressed up all the time. What do you do? Right, right. And, and you know, so I look at what you're, what, you're, what you're saying right now, and it's basically these foundational items you know, that I'm hearing from you that we all know we should do. I mean, we all know we should dress profession. We should control our schedule. We should be proactive in how we run our business, that we should proactively generate leads, yet you're doing it. It probably sounds super overwhelming to a lot of people that are listening right now going, where do I even start with this? So let me ask you, if you could go back and, and pinpoint any one or two things you started with, or even some mistakes you did that you'd go back and do differently, where does someone start going from the struggling, reactive, trying to parent, trying to real, be in real estate, where does someone start to make that change? What's okay. actually? So step one is figure out what does success look like to you? Is success just regularly closing one deal a month? Is success closing five deals a month? And then you work backwards and then you figure out what activities you need to have consistently every single day and what's going to help you feel good as a person, as a parent. For me, I don't feel good unless I've gotten a good workout in. For me, I don't feel good as a parent unless I know that I have sat down and had dinner with my kids without my phone every single night. You know, we do a little thing um, when we do when we eat dinner every night, we call it our roses and our thorns. We talk about the best thing from the day and the worst thing from the day. You know, and it's just that opportunity to connect with my kids. Um, I'm remarried now, but I actually still live as a single mom because my husband and I don't even live together. Um, and I started that with his kids and his kids love doing that. And so, you know, just those little things, but, but where to start, figure out what your success will look like to you and then work, work backwards and figure out the thing you can do for each area. Cause there really are basically five areas in your life that you need to focus on. You need to focus on professional. You need to focus on your relationships. You need to focus on your mental focus, your financial focus, and your spiritual focus. And so when you, when you figure out even just one thing that you can consistently do every single day, I actually just read something the other day, and there's an up and coming uh, psychologist that I've really been following a lot. And I really, really am impressed with him. His name's Benjamin Hardy. And he wrote a book called Willpower Doesn't Work. And he sends out these regular emails that I get every week. And it, it's basically how I've operated. But he was talking about um, a rowing team, I think, from the UK. And they hadn't won any medals in the Olympics since like 1912. And they sat down as a team and said, we're going to, like, we want to medal. We want to win gold. Like, what can we do? And every single thing boiled down to asking themselves, one question that changed every decision they made. And it was, was this going to make the boat go faster? So there's a late night party. Is that going to make the boat go faster? Nope. Because I'm probably going to have a hard time getting up for my workout in the morning. There's some junk food. Is this going to make the boat go faster? No, you know, so I'm not going to eat it. There's, you know, am I going to dedicate my time to this? Will it make the boat go faster? No, because it'll take away from my training. So I'm not going to do it. So if you just really boil everything down to one question, is this going to promote me building in one of these five areas in my life? Because you can't have imbalance and be like a level 10 in one area and a level one in another area. No, and I think, because uh, I love where you're going with this, and, and I talk about this all the time with the people I work with, those five pillars, as you, as you kind of just demonstrated, what I see is people will think that if they focus first on professional, then their personal life is going to, you know, magically get, 
get better. If they focus on, you know, physical, then somehow that's going to relate to professional. You have to basically do all of these things at the same time. Otherwise you end up like a car with a flat tire that just doesn't run correctly. Right. So you have to be able to focus time on all of this because it's a holistic approach. Like you're an ecosystem and all five of those pillars are important. Right. But I think that's the one thing that you've done very well. And I hope that our, our audience today doesn't miss that, that, for you to think you're going to do great business development without taking care of your personal development and your personal and family life, um, there's going to be an issue there, I believe. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can do all the professional development that you want, but if you show up to something overweight, looking disheveled, I'm sorry, you're, you're just not going to command the audience you want to have. And obviously, it's not all about looks, but it's just the persona that you're bringing across. And so... If you figure out what success looks like in each of those five areas and then do even just one thing every day to build up each of those five areas, you're going to start seeing success. You just will. So what you're talking about is moving the needle a little bit every day, right? You're not talking about massive shifts every day. You're going to, you know, in a week's time, be a whole different person. You're talking about moving the needle little by little setting actionable bite-sized commitments, not goals, but like commitments every single day, sticking to those things. And over time, one little degree at a time, you get your 180 degree turn. I mean, that's kind of what I'm hearing from exactly. you. Exactly, because here's the thing. If you are sitting on a couch and you're like, I'm gonna go run 100K, and you've never run a mile before, right? you really think you're probably gonna see it through with your training that it takes to go from couch to 100K. Like there's a reason that the training program's couch to 5K because just do something little by little because if you, if you bite off too much, you're just, you're setting yourself up for failure. And I, so think, uh, and I think with your story, the reason it resonates again with me is because you are building both your family and personal and business and all of these things simultaneously and you were doing so for so long on your own right you know, so when I look at you know the agents I work with and they're struggling to do it and they have support systems and they have means to do so yet it's a mental block why they're not doing it that's that's one of my most um, biggest takeaways with you is how you're able to remove the mental blocks and work in all these pillars in your life simultaneously. And the evidence shows because you've elevated in all those areas. Um, you know, so what you're telling people to do, where to start with is take a look at where they want to be, right. reverse engineer that, right. and then break it down to little manageable commitments every single day and not look at, you know, I mean, it's like going to the gym twice. You can go to the gym 10 hours one day, you're not gonna change. Right. But if you go to the, you know, to the gym a half an hour, 45 minutes for 10 weeks, pretty soon there's, there's changes, right? It takes time to, to facilitate that. And right. you have to have the mindset in order to, to make that work, to last with it, to not give up. Because how you look at things is going to flow through every aspect mm -hmm. of your life too. And so being present for 10 hours for your kid one time is not going to make for a solid relationship. But for me, I spend, you know, five or 10 minutes one-on-one -on -one with each of my kids every night when I tuck them into bed, I still tuck my kids into bed, right. you know, and that's where we get to sit and talk about their day. And that's right. And that's just kind of our little ritual. And so I know that I can commit that time to them a lot easier than I can carve 10 hours out of my day to be one-on-one -on -one with them. Right. And what's going to make more of a difference? Well, it's probably the 10 minutes, you know, every night that we spend together. And, and so it's making sure that it's consistency matters more than just a one time here and there thing. So you're, you're having your non-negotiables. I mean, those bedtime rituals, that's a non-negotiable you're doing it. You've got your non-negotiables. You're working your other stuff around those. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, that's kind of the way that I'm hearing it. Uh, now, for the agents watching at home that are, that are struggling with this, again, that are, you know, wanting to be successful for their kids, feeling, you know, guilty if they can't be with their kids all the time in the way that they'd like to be, I, I kind of want to draw back again on the successes you've had with your approach. Because from what I remember with you is your kids have excelled at sports or excelled at school, 
I mean, they get great grades. They're learning work ethic from you. It's not where they're resentful towards you. They're learning work ethic from you. And it's translating in their life in all these positive ways. And I think you're kind of making them part of the real estate process, right? I mean, that's another thing you're doing. So you're involving them in what you do in your career. So they're learning from that and they're being part of it. And so your successes are their successes. So is that a fair statement, would you say? It is. And I mean, I will be the first person to say, I am not perfect. There's times that my kids have been grumpy about this or that, but you know what? Life is also not just rainbows and sparkles. And I want to teach my kids also how to deal with disappointment too, because that's part of life too. So, you know, are there times where my kids have been like, Oh mom, you're working so much. And I say, well, yeah, but remember we went school shopping and you got American Eagle jeans, you know, remember, you know, and so it's teaching them trade-offs in life too. And so the thing though, that, I love because example is the biggest teacher. And so like, again, I go back to boxing. I was talking to my son's boxing coach a couple of weeks ago and he said, I wish I could have a million of your kid because he said he is so committed and he works so hard. And, you know, my kids have said that, you know, their teachers comment like, and they're nice too. Like I teach my kids to be nice people. And it's amazing the little things that our kids pick up on and just watching what we do. My kids see that I get up early every single morning. Well, I had to take my husband to the airport on Monday and my son wanted to go running with me. So my almost 13 year old son got up at 4.45 in the morning so he could go running with me. Like there's not that many kids out there that would do that. And again, it's because my kids know that I get up early every single morning. So to them, that's just normal. Like you just do that. Well, how many people in the world actually get up, you know, between four and five every morning? Not a lot. But again, because I've set the example for my kids, they think that's what's normal. My kids think that being a hard worker is that's what's normal. And so it's interesting to watch them as they start, as, they, as they've actually started noticing the difference between their work ethic and some of the kids they go to school with. And they're like, mom, some kids are so lazy or mom, some kids just don't know how to do anything for themselves. And I'm like, you're right. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, because again, my, my kids know how to cook real food because I cook real food. I make them work in the kitchen with me. And then there's times where I'll be like, Hey, dinner's on the stove. I've got to run and show this house really fast. We'll eat together when I get back. But while I'm gone, can you pull this out of the oven or, you know, stir this while it's cooking and whatever, just really teaching them life skills at the same time. And so it's so important to have that work ethic that we want to show our kids to have our kids have too. So it goes back to those pillars, right? You're showing them in your personal life, you're incorporating those work ethic practices. They're bringing it then into their fitness life with the, and the personal life with the athletics they're doing. They're bringing it into their school life or their future business life, right? So it's going across all these pillars as we were talking about earlier, that you can't just focus on one. You got to lay the foundation of behaviors for all of them and they all kind of rise together. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I love that. But where do you see yourself now? You know, you've grown so much in five years. Um, you know, uh, a tagline of the, of the million dollar mom doesn't just get, you know, passed around to anybody, um, you know, because you've done so well in luxury and you're, you're, everything's done great. Where do you see yourself going in the next few years? Does any of this change? Are you still on track to, to grow? Right. So one of the passions that I have is in teaching and helping other people learn to live this lifestyle. And so really my next venture, I see setting up more coaching and, and it not being a myopic piece of just real estate. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like if you're super myopic in your approach, again, on anything, mm -hmm. you're missing out on the rest of it. And so I really want to teach people how to do this life and to juggle it. And again, to step back and ask themselves, you know, is this going to make the boat grow go faster? Is this going to make my business grow? Or is this going to improve my relationships? Or because let's be real again, if you're super myopic of, is this going to improve my relationship? Well, let's take a step back. If you can't pay your bills, you're probably not going to have very good relationships because you're going to be a total stress case. Right. So it's looking at everything from a holistic approach in, will this contribute to my success and your success being those five things? I, I love, I love how you're putting the, the term, will it make the boat go faster? Because I think what people lose sight of is what the actual goal is, 
right. um, you know, closing these two transactions this month is not the actual goal. That's the fastest way to get your paycheck in the next two weeks. But your real goal is does this move forward to move the needle forward in my business? Does this move the needle forward in my family? Does whatever that goal is to remember what the actual long-term goal is and do, does this get me closer to that? Yeah. Um, so I love that. I love that thought process of does it make the boat go faster in every decision you're making? That's, that's huge. I think. Um, so just to wrap this up, I know we're probably getting pretty close on time. Um, can you give a little bit of a, of a insight? I think if I remember right, you had some either parenting credentials or went to school or something for, for that. Can you give a little bit of background on that as well? So my bachelor's degree is actually in child development. So there were several things I could have gotten my teaching credential with that and been like an elementary school teacher, or I could have gone on and gone to grad school and um, to be like a marriage and family therapist. And again, that does not mean that I haven't figured out or that I have, you know, that I'm perfect in implementing all of this. I just am really thankful that I've had an educational background that has helped fuel me and teach me how to put some of these things in place to teach my kids from a really young age. Well, I think, I think you're being humble on that fact because your approach, you know, is going to be controversial for some people in the industry. They're going to, they're going to say, that's never going to work for me. One thing we see in real estate, and you probably heard it a thousand times, right? This doesn't work in my market. This will never work for me. It's always the, the reasons why not, not the, how can I, it's just the, I can't. Right. right. So here's you that takes on a, a pretty cool parenting approach that has a real result, but you also have the background in child development. So there's that credential that overlay this as well. So, you know, as far as modeling yourself, you know, if you're listening to this right now, part of the audience, as far as modeling yourself after a successful parenting program, I think it's really, really good to look at what you've done, Amanda, because I think people need that guidance. It, they really do, I believe. So, um, and I feel like people, my, my husband that I'm married to, made a really funny comment when we were first dating. And he said, I think you were just dumb enough. And he was not saying this like in a mean way to not know that you weren't supposed to be this successful. Right. So you listen to everyone around you. Oh, this doesn't work in our market. This is, well, there were probably a lot of things that I did right off the bat in my career that people would have told me didn't work in our market. And guess what? It actually did for right. me. So I love the quote that says a flower doesn't pay attention to the flowers around it. It just blooms. Yep. So take what is going to work for you, what will build success for you and just run with it. You know, a lot of people say, Oh, open houses don't work. Oh, this and that. I actually built my business on open houses to begin with. There were weekends I would ha hold six open houses in a weekend again, because I had that pressure and pressure does amazing things. If you, I mean, it's the burn the boat mindset. And that's what I did. I burned the boats. I had no other option but to be successful. Yeah. And, and you, you've proven that time and time again. Um, I, I really do, like I said, I really do love the fact that not only, um, not only did you come in with the, what's the right way to say it? Because my partner and I say this all, this all the time too. We're just dumb enough to think we can do it. Like we, we don't understand that we shouldn't, be successful yeah. doing what we're doing, right? right? But that's what you did is you took your approach. It's authentic. It's genuine. You've, you've got the, the background in child development. You have the confidence in yourself to put it all together. You're leveraging efficiency. You're, you're controlling your schedule. You're focusing on dollar producing activities. You're doing all the right things. Um, you know, so again, just as we wrap up, I want to reiterate the one or two things that someone can really do to start down the path you did. If we could just wrap up with that, that'd be awesome. I just want to make sure they really catch that. I would say, again, take those five areas in life, your, your personal relationships, your physical health, your spiritual health, your business health, your financial health, really figure out what success looks like in each of those areas and then find something every single day that you can do for each of those areas to make the boat go faster. What are you going to do? Just one simple thing every day in each of those five areas and you will start feeling such a personal sense of accomplishment, which will, excuse me, boil over to having a professional sense of accomplishment and helping you have that mindset and that demeanor and commanding that respect. It'll help you feel like you're a better parent because you did something every day to connect with your kids. It'll help you feel like a better partner. It'll, I mean, just, it, it's a snowball effect 
that as your tide rises in one area in your life, it's going to rise in every area of your life in your, if you're contributing to each of those areas every day. And that's my takeaway from this too, um, from our talk today. I mean, that is a great takeaway that people can, you know, start working on right now, tomorrow, right? Um, if people want to follow you beyond this interview, are you on Instagram, Facebook? Where can people see what you're up to? Instagram, Facebook. I mean, it, I don't post a lot personally anymore, but you can see professional stuff. And I am, I kind of have a resolution in changing how I'm going to be posting more personally lately as I start kind of building. I'm actually in the building phase right now of this kind of coaching mentoring program that I'm going to be starting. And so that'll be a way to see, you know, kind of some of that content too. So Instagram, um, I think it's called the Amanda Todd group on Facebook, Amanda Thomas and Todd. I'm pretty easy to find. You see a picture of me with my three kiddos. So right, right. tiny and sweet and innocent. <laughs> well, Amanda, it was, uh, it was really good talking with you today. And hopefully the audience uh, watching got as much value out of it as I did. You gave me a lot of really good stuff to think about myself uh, for the agents that I work with. So hopefully we'll be following you in the future and, and we're all rooting for your success. We love what you're doing. So thank you again for spending the time today with me. Well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I love getting to chat with you. You bet. All right. So there we go. Have a good day, Lab Code agents. <laughs>